um, welcome. Um, this is the, we have had a number of different meetings around the the work we're doing, the impatient or the kind of pathway work we're doing. But this is the first meeting which is really focusing on the improvement. Um, so it's an opportunity to bring us all together from across the southeast. I'm really pleased that we're joined by um, CSU colleagues in relation to Crest, national colleagues, and also. Um, colleagues from London that will be talking through the SMART um, tool, Capacity um, Management Live tool. So um, the programme, for those of you um, that haven't joined one of these meetings before, is really an opportunity to come together, aligning um, national, all the programmes of work um, in relation to the um, driving improvement through our inpatient pathway. The programme, and we're going to be running through it, um, in a minute is very much about kind of using data, being led by the data and also both quantitative but also qualitative. So we're really um, understanding the experiences of people that are using our services, the clinicians um, really leading and, and helping to shape how we can make improvements as well as um, analysts and others. So really bringing us all together to look at how we can improve the pathway, which is, as I think we're all aware, really stretched and challenged at the moment in the context of COVID. And the other thing just to mention is this is a time limited program. It obviously aligns with the NHSEI um, acute and crisis um, LTP deliverables. But this is an improve. This is a program which is really focused on um, tangible kind of improvement deliverables. But as I said, we will be um, running through that in a minute. Um, I'm just wondering about whether we do some introductions because um, it's really nice to know who's here. But I also don't want to um, use up too much time, but it's, it is good to know who's here. So if we can just go around and um, just say who you are, what your role is, that would be um, really lovely just to get a sense of um, who's on the meeting. Andy, you're first. So should we just start with you just to say hello? Hi Katrina, I'm not going to turn my camera on because I was trying to grab a bit of lunch. But no, don't I, worry, don't worry. I'm Andy Erskine, Skin Director of Effectiveness, Innovation and Social Work at Surrey and Borders, working across Heartlands of Trimley Health, and I'm often the person that tries to tally up some of the OAPS numbers and crisis yes. care type stuff. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy, and welcome. Um, Angela Bird. Hello, um, I'm the Patient Flow Transformation Lead um, for Oxford Health. Brilliant. Thank you, Angela. And Duncan Simpson? Hi, I'm Duncan Simpson, the Head of Information at Berkshire Healthcare. Fantastic. Welcome, Duncan. Hi. And Gareth Edwards? Uh, Gareth Edwards, Data Management Lead for Solon NHS Trust. Excellent. And Fifi? Hello, uh, I'm from the Southeast region as well, and uh, my title is a Quality Improvement Manager, and also my background is informatic. So, hi, everyone. Hi, Fifi. And Neil? Hi, I'm Neil Fragedy. I'm Head of Performance Information here at the Isle of Wight. Brilliant, fantastic. Thank you. And Janine? Sorry. Hi, I'm Janine Gladwell. I am the Performance Legal Manager at Sweden NHS Trust. Brilliant. Welcome. And Jenny? Hi, I'm the Digital Programme Lead for the Integrated Care Partnership across Portsmouth and South East Ham CCGs. Brilliant, fantastic. Welcome, Jenny and Jack. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack. Uh, I'm from the South East Regional Team providing uh, project support in the data and analysis section of the Inpatient Improvement Programme. Thank you, Jack. And Daniel? Hi, I'm Daniel Jameson. I'm a Senior Contract Information Analyst working for the CSU. Brilliant, thank you. And Joe. So I work for Nell CSU, Surgeon Manager Lead across North East London. I work with Judith's team in NHSE and I for the Smart Rollout. Fantastic, thank you, Joe. Laura. Hi, I'm a Senior Project Manager in the National Adult Mental Health Team, and I'll be talking to you um, in shortly uh, about some of the work that I do. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. And Liz? Hi, I'm Liz. I'm the Associate Director for People Participation at Sussex Partnership. Brilliant. Thank you, Liz. And Steve? 
So there's Steve Lamb, the head of Rumble Red Ulster Southeast, Southeast and Hampshire Framework Gospel CCG's ICP lead for mental health and ICS lead for mental health modelling demand and capacity. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. And Louise. Hi, I'm Louise Patmore. I'm the participation programme lead for the Sussex Healthcare Partnership, our ICS. Brilliant. Thank you, Louise. Michelle. I'm Michelle Fasello. I work with Katrina and Jack on the um, Inpatient Improvement Programme. Brilliant. Thank you. And Claire? Oh. Hi, I'm Claire Page. I'm Head of Performance Information at Oxford Health NHS Trust. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Welcome. And Ruth? Hi, um, I'm, I'm the lead for acute mental health care at NHSEI. I work out with uh, Laura and I'll be talking to you in a minute about our kind of key priorities for the next coming months. Brilliant, thank you Ruth. And Sue? Hi, I'm Sue Damrokul and I'm from Southern Health and I'm responsible for transformation, planning, performance and contracting. Brilliant, thank you Sue. Um, have we missed anybody off? Um, I don't know if I introduced myself actually, <laughs> sorry. So I'm Katrina Lake, um, um, the Assistant Director of Programmes um, working across the South East in the Mental Health Learning Disability and Autism Cell. Um, and I think Loretta, um, so just an introduction, who you are would be great. Hi, I'm Loretta Cabin, the Mental Health Programme Director in the Kenton Medway System and for the CCG lead. Uh, the CCG I lead on um, restart mental health modelling. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. So, I mean, it is fantastic. We've got, um, you know, really good representation from across the patch. And I think kind of reflecting what I was saying earlier in the meeting as an introduction is this is a this is really um, this programme is, is focused. We're aiming for it to be um, focused on really tangible kind of improvements and deliverables. And today is an opportunity to hear about some of those and how we can all work together across the southeast. So thank you very much, Laura and Ruth, that have joined from the national team. Um, I think we've got some slides from you. Um, and I think those will hopefully be coming up on the screen now. So should we just hand over to you to give us an update in relation to national priorities and funding? Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I think going to start off as our first giving that kind of real overview of the inpatient program and then I'm going to talk about some of the specifics I'm leading on so um, Ruth if you want to make a start. Sure thanks Laura um, and it's really nice to be here um, I was we were speaking at something yesterday and I, I just really has made me recognize how um, compared to our kind of usual year in the national team when we get to go out and visit so many services and, and areas we've not obviously been able to do that this year so it's actually really nice to join a, a session where there's so many different local areas represented um, and really kind of keen to get your views and hear about your experiences and things um, as Laura said we're just going to give um, an overview of our kind of key national commitments and priorities in relation to inpatient care um, but obviously um, also recognise um, the difficulties that we face this year and the impact of COVID-19 and how that's shaped the work that we're doing at the moment and what we're going to be doing um, and also going to, as I say, really interested to hear your views on all of those things. So um, this slide just summarises, I suppose, the, the sort of four key long-term plan commitments or current national priorities that relate most directly to improving um, inpatient mental health care. Um, so that top one, which is one of our kind of headline LTP ambitions to improve the therapeutic offer on inpatient wards um, and reduce unnecessary time that's spent in hospital. I should talk a little bit uh, about in a bit more detail in a moment, um, but that's an area of work that Laura is leading on um, and I think has been particularly challenged by COVID. Um, but we're really keen to kind of build from the learning of this year and um, and drive that forward over the next over the next coming months. Um, second one, and I'm sure everyone's very familiar with this, is our um, commitment to eliminate acute out of area placements um, for adults. Um, at the moment, we're still publicly committed to doing that by the end of this financial year. Um, although what I would say um, is that we completely recognise that this is an unprecedented situation and that a lot of the plans that people did have in place um, have been disrupted by this year. Um, so while, yes, we are still supporting areas to progress that, that we um, our main priorities that is done safely 
And so if that means that we have to adjust our expectations, um, that is something that we are doing and looking at um, looking at how, how we might have to go about doing that. But at the moment, absolutely a priority. Um, and we'll be focusing on what further support we can give, particularly over the winter period, um, to help people manage within um, capacity. And I know you guys have done some excellent work in that in the southeast. Um, the third thing I wanted to mention was around um, the Mental Health Act review. So the Mental Health Act Reviews report actually came out almost two years ago um, and the government's response, which will be a white paper, is another thing that's been impacted by COVID and that it was publication has been delayed. Um, but we're actually now expecting that that might come out this side of Christmas. Um, I think, again, probably familiar with like the kind of key messages of that, but the ultimate aim is that um, the reforms that are proposed in that document will reduce the number of people that are detained overall, but also when people are detained, help them to retain as much choice and control about their care and treatment as possible. And it's really in line with um, the rest of the work that we want to do around um, shifting care to a more uh, preventative focus in the community uh, and and um, improving the therapeutic the therapeutic nature of it. Um, and the final thing that I don't think we can ignore when we're talking about improving quality of inpatient care is the environment. Um, we've known since we published the long term plan for mental health that um, securing a, a decent capital funding settlement would be absolutely critical for us to be able to really bring up the quality of the care that we can offer. Um, there has been some progress towards that already this year. So we've got um, a, a good settlement to help us eradicate dormitories, which I'm sure everyone will agree is massively overdue. Um, but we're, we're also, we also know that that is not the be all and end all of what needs to be done to improve mental health in um, inpatient estate. Um, and we will be trying to get um, further funding to help us do the um, kind of broader work as well there. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, I won't dwell too long on this, but um, and I'll also credit Laura for, for capturing so neatly in one diagram what we think are the key elements of a good therapeutic offer uh, in inpatient settings. Um, and each element of this, is it, it kind of maps out the whole pathway from that admission uh, point of admission through the episode of care itself and, and into um, discharge. And what we're planning to do with the programme is to do a bit more of a deep dive into each of these areas over the coming months um, and develop kind of best practice and resources to support people to to focus on improvement across these these elements so um we're definitely be keen to get people's feedback on this um laura is going to talk a little bit more specifically about effective discharge planning and timely follow-up um in a moment that's where we've decided to focus our attention first um largely uh, as i'll come on to because of the pressures that we're seeing in this such a good opportunity scope for improvement in that particular area um, if you just go on to the next slide thank you um, it's also worth saying that there is national funding um, in the system to support um, that improvement in therapeutic care and that ambition to bring down um, length of hospital stay um, the funding actually started this year um, you can see that the main um, t uh, the main line at the top so it was 8 million nationally, um, but it goes up to 46 million by 2023 24. Um, now, it is in baseline, so we're really keen that systems know that it's there and can make sure that they are, are accessing that funding. Um, and there, there's more information can be shared about what that would look like for your, your patch, what that profile would look like for your patch. And um, we've not been overly prescriptive about how it's used. Um, we're really keen that there's a focus on quality in terms of interventions and activities on. We know that all the different systems have different pressures and things that they would, would like to use that funding on. But the, the main thing is that it is used in inpatient settings. Um, and I'm sure this group will be a really good place to kind of making sure that it's used as effectively as possible. Um, and we're hopeful that the resources that we develop with the programme work nationally will kind of support areas to use that um, well over the next few years. Because by 2023-24, for some STPs, that's kind of like a approximately a million pounds so it's 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 a it's a decent chunk of money um we've just gone to the next slide thank you um i just wanted to spend um a few minutes talking about the impact of covid um because it obviously has been a completely unprecedented challenge for all mental health services but i think particularly um for inpatient services 
Um, and I've just pulled out, um, these are a few of the things that Laura and I have um, over the last few months through the engagement that we've been doing and the feedback that we've got from areas, some of the particular challenges that we're aware of that we know people have had to find really well, um, innovative solutions to. So obviously IPC um, just always been important, but it's um, completely changed in terms of, it, it's of, of how critical that now is um, to ensure that COVID doesn't become a hospital acquired infection and the need to cohort patients and prevent transmission has obviously um, led to issues around capacity um, and um, needing to people to self-isolate and all of those additional challenges, um, really, really challenging for trusts. Um, in addition to that, we know that PPE, just having to wear PPE is going to impact on that therapeutic relationship. Um, and there's loads of other things as well, like restrictions around um, what people can have access to and who people can have access to while they're on their wards, visiting their family members and support networks, access to leave and outdoor space. I mean, these are all things that we have been advocating are maintained as far as possible through the pandemic. Um, but we know that it has been really challenging and that, as I say, you've had to come up with really innovative solutions to be able to keep those things going. Um, Obviously, this has all been under, underpinned as well by a massive impact on staffing, both from absence from um, from having to um, because of COVID itself, but but also the impact of, on staff well-being. When it's been really really challenging, um, and that's obviously going to have a knock-on impact on the care that's offered. Um, the other thing we've heard a lot about is about the increased acuity and overall numbers of patients actually needing inpatient care. Um, which I think, again, recognise that there is an element that need is genuinely increasing because of the impact of the lockdown and COVID on people's mental health. Um, but also that there was particularly in the first wave, a lot of disruption to pathways, particularly in the community, and that maybe people weren't able to access help um, when they normally would and now are presenting in a much more um, acutely unwell state. Um, and um, that also has a, an impact at the other end of the inpatient pathway and helping to make sure people are discharged safely and can be supported in the community. Um, saying all that, there's definitely a lot of really positive things that we've heard as well. And if people have managed to um, deliver care under these incredibly difficult challenges and actually some really brilliant stuff has come out of it, we've heard a lot about excellent partnership and system working and collaboration and people just are working in much more permissive cultures. Um, and finding ways to keep those inter-organisational um, communications going, you know, using um, more better use of digital technology, for example, um, and, and sort of innovative um, use of those things and, and better and more focus on making sure that the system is is working as, as, as smoothly as it possibly can. So there's definitely some good things. And um, I think we've got a, a case study there of, of how um, I think it's Northamptonshire, how they've adapted during the pandemic and some of the great learning that they can share. Um, and just one last slide from me. Um, thank you. Um, and I know that Katrina has already alluded to this. And, we know that the system is possibly under more or more pressure than it than it's ever been. I mean, I think we're not um, pressures are not a new thing in inpatient mental health pathways, um, but with the impact of COVID, it is it is does feel very different this year as we're going into winter. Um, I think there is an expectation that the demand for mental health services will probably continue to increase because of the repercussions of COVID and the lockdowns that we've experienced this year. Um, at the moment, um, bed occupancy is, is really high. I think the average is over 90% nationally for acute uh, adult acute inpatient beds. And we know that a lot of areas are kind of hitting 100% and that out of area placements are starting to increase, um, particularly in some of the areas that actually had managed to really bring them down. So completely recognised that that is a, a big challenge for areas. Um, and I think that's something that this, that you as a group are, are focusing on in particular. Um, one thing is there is some optimism that there are some areas that are, are managing to cope well. Um, and we think it's particularly important that we kind of share at the moment what's working, what isn't working. Um, and we're really keen to, to help um, do that at a national level and between regional teams to make sure that we're spreading, uh, spreading best practice as best we can. Um, 
I think um, I'm going to hand over to Laura now to talk specifically about discharge, because as I mentioned, that's an area that we particularly want to focus on um, over the coming months, as we do think there's a, a um, significant scope to, to see some of that improvement across the pathway. Thanks, Ruth. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so as kind of brief was um, saying um, a moment ago about particularly during the pandemic, we're seeing um, real bed pressures. So at the start of the pandemic, there was a real push to kind of um, discharge a number of patients, obviously uh, in a safe way to make sure that were less risk of potentially contracting COVID um, in an inpatient setting. However, we're now seeing um, that kind of rise in bed occupancy um, uh, return to kind of uh, pre-COVID levels. And actually we're seeing kind of um, more and more delayed uh, bed days as a result. And we know that there's a number of factors that can uh, cause um, bed delays, for example, funding disputes between NHS and local authority amongst um, other things. And so we want to make sure that we can address some of these barriers and really make sure that there's processes in place um, as early as possible to um, support patients to be discharged um, as timely and effective as possible. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so I have set up an expert reference group and based on um, their feedback, along with a number of key uh, stakeholders and a lot of kind of research and policies out there, um, these are kind of some of the key principles that we um, that have been highlighted that can really, really help support that timely and effective discharges. So number one, purposeful goal oriented um, admissions. Um, so professionals working with people, um, their family, their carers um, every day during their admission. So making sure that every day um, the clinical, therapeutic and social interventions are there to really support their recovery um, and help remove any barriers to discharge. Number two, early discharge planning. So um, looking to put in place um, as early as possible, um, an estimated discharge date can help really support um, that uh, timely uh, discharge when uh, required. Uh, number three, sharing information. So sharing information with patients, um, their family carers every day in a way that enables patient and, and carers choice. Um, and also be mindful of the access to advocates uh, when required to help support that, um, that decision making and discharge planning process and ensuring that um, the patient and carer voice um, are heard. Number four, integrated partnership working. Obviously, um, in a patient's um, care, there's normally a variety of different stakeholders involved um, in their care. So, for example, social care, housing, community mental health teams. Um, so making sure that they're obviously involved as early as possible. Um, so those decisions can be made um, as quickly um, as possible as well. Number five, regular care plan review. Um, again, this can really help support some of the decisions needed to support that discharge planning. Uh, number six, helping the person keep in touch with life outside. So as Ruth mentioned earlier, uh, we know during the pandemic um, and some trusts have already come up with different ways to help um, maintain patients contact with loved ones outside. Um, so just thinking about how that can be maintained, um, but also looking at facilitating trial periods at home, so that's section 17 leave. Um, uh, to really help support um, that discharge planning and making sure that someone is ready for discharge. Um, and then number seven, timely support at and following discharge. So um, making sure that someone is followed up within 72 hours um, and that has actually become a national standard. So I'll uh, talk about that in a bit more detail, but just to say, obviously these are kind of some of our key principles. Um, and the idea is that um, we're then looking to turn these into kind of a quick guide and, and talk about some kind of uh, good examples to really illustrate some of these principles, but they're not set in stone. It'd be good to hear if you've got any feedback or comments or any of these, um, as that will help really inform the development of our guidance going forward. So we go to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, that kind of last one about timely follow up. Um, so this really came about um, following a lot of evidence from the National uh, Confident, uh, Confidential Inquiry um, around um, suicide and safety and mental health. And this evidence that there were a really high number of suicides um, following patient discharge, particularly within the first week of someone leaving hospital uh, with the highest number on the third day. So uh, which is why there's a real big from that seven day uh, follow up standard, which was uh, recently in place to that 72 um, hour um, standard and keeping that, that three day and really uh, trying to prevent um, the, the number of suicides potentially occurring. 
Um, to really support this, a sequin was introduced um, last financial year, so in 2019 and 20, and this was there as an incentive for providers to um, start thinking about how they could um, have that timely really follow up in place and, and meet that 72 hour standard. Um, as I mentioned, we're now actually in um, that that has now become a national standard following um, the the sequin success. Um, and this is now yeah, a 72 hour um, standard. Um, the successful sequence actually saw 59% of total discharges nationally receive follow ups in 72 hours. Obviously, this is really great because um, previously um, there, there wasn't as many uh, trusts uh, meeting that, that follow up time, but obviously we still got uh, improvement to go. So um, if we go to the next slide, um, that standard will really help support that that um, that move to ensure trusts are now uh, achieving at least 80% of patients discharged from inpatient settings um, that are followed up within 72 hours. Um, just to note that this standard is not just meant to bring focus to the timeliness of follow up, um, but it also is around the quality of, of, um, of follow up as well. So one of the things that we're looking to do is look at uh, good practice examples um, from trust to help provide um, examples of where um, the, the timeliness and the quality has been um, achieved or think about how other trusts can um, can learn from them as well. Um, the other thing also to mention is I keep saying 72 hour flop but that's not um, to say that patients should be followed up at that kind of 72 hour marker it's a maximum follow up so if patients need to be uh, followed up before that 72 hour period, um, then that's just there as kind of an indication. Um, but there may be instances where patients should be followed up a lot quicker. Um, and then just lastly, um, just to say that we the guidance states that this follow up should be uh, wherever possible um, done in a face to face uh, manner. But obviously during the pandemic, we realised that that may be slightly more difficult. So we do say where assessed to be clinically appropriate, then um, trust can contact the person by telephone or other suitable technology. Um, but in terms of some of the details around that follow up, um, I provide a link there so you can see a bit more about the guidance and FAQs around that. So um, to find out a bit more detail. Um, and that's it from us. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. That was really helpful um, running through that. And I think particularly because um, very much what we're about here is is pulling together our kind of knowledge and expertise around around this pathway, but also the response to COVID. So I think highlighting some of those kind of real challenges and how we can really pull our thinking together around how we respond at the moment is very helpful. So thank you for that. Um, any comments, reflections, questions for Laura and Ruth? You can put your hand up. Hopefully you've all got access to the hand function or just unmute yourself and speak because we've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, Loretta. <laughs> Hi, thank you for that helpful uh, presentation. I wondered from the, the SITREP information that you're getting, uh, whether you can see the extent to which uh, our acute inpatient beds are being used by people with a learning disability and autism. And in that context then, might be able to help us in improving the adjustments that acute services may make to provide for people with autism in particular. Um, and I think too, maybe for us to have a, a, a an understanding about the kinds of factors we'd consider when an acute inpatient admission isn't appropriate. Um, as you mentioned there, you know, our acute inpatient services are running very hot. Uh, as you said, in terms of case mix, higher acuity, more complexity and risk. Um, and sometimes, despite all of the goodwill and so on, it's probably not a, a good environment for somebody with autism. So we're struggling a bit with the Kent and Medway. It's something that's um, become it seems to have just come out clearer to us uh, through COVID uh, but I do know that uh, colleagues from Surrey and I know Andy's in the meeting they had identified before us you know sometime last year and um, and I think Sussex colleagues as well so yeah really about LD and autism um, so people with LD and autism in our acute inpatient services and in terms of therapeutic you know what what is 
what is really good and when is an admission to an acute service probably not the best thing yeah thanks katrina yeah thank you loretta really good question it is a really good question i don't know if i necessarily have like an easy answer to it um i think highlighting whether that's something that we can look at in the sitrep data is is a really good question and i think we'll take that away and see yeah. i think we probably can from what i remember about how it's filled yeah. out yeah, there is a field in there where you say of the beds that are occupied, how many are occupied by people with a learning disability or autism? And so is what you're seeing an increase in use of beds that were not originally intended for people um, with, a, with a learning disability or autism? Or Yes, I mean, there are acute and patient mental health beds and of course should be ac yeah. accessible to anybody who's acutely mentally unwell, you know, with a mental illness. And the issue with We've seen more use of those beds by people with a learning disability or autism since March. And indeed, um, like today, from our sit reps, we have 10 acute inpatients who have a learning disability or autism. Yeah. And uh, last Friday, we had five uh, men placed out of area for psychiatric intensive care um, because of that dual diagnosis of being acutely mentally unwell in a context of having complex autism. So yeah, it's it's quite uh, for us a notable change in case mix, as it were. Yeah, that's, no, it's really it's really interesting to hear. I mean, it sounds like it's definitely something that we should look at in if that's becoming a more prominent um, presentation. Then that's something that we should probably look at in this program. I'm also, do you th are you saying that there's been or you it looks like there's also been a relationship between that and COVID that the the is it because of pressure on the system, you think, possibly? I don't know. I think um, my colleagues on the call might perhaps share an impression that mm. uh, COVID has been especially hard on people with an autistic spectrum disorder. Mm. And that's to say people of all ages. You know, mm. we have yeah. various uh, signals of that across our services spectrums, I think. Mm. Um, and it's just that I think you know, when we think about risk management and so on in mental health services, we tend to think back from people who are acutely mentally unwell or in a mental health crisis, don't we? Mm -hmm. In terms of where risk, complexity and so on is, it? you know, and our AMP services, for example, reported this morning, you know, they're waiting to assess a young woman, complex autism, mm -hmm. very unwell. So they're, they've been called in to do a mental health act assessment. It's raised a whole lot of challenges within a family, raising safeguarding issues, very mm -hmm. complex. So we're seeing that. And like I said, we had five people placed out of area last week for peak because of complex autism and being acutely mentally ill. Yeah. Yeah, it's at that end of the spectrum, but I think right across the spectrum and across all ages. Yeah. And Loretta, I mean, thank you. It's a really important point to raise. And it's interesting that this is an issue pre-COVID. Yeah. So this is certainly not a new issue, but it's it's um so been it's it's been amplified and exacerbated by COVID because the other issue is around length of stay as well um, for people with autism, which would be very interesting to do a bit of an analysis of. Yeah. OK, sorry, Ruth, I think you were going to say something. No, I mean, something for, it's, thank you for raising it. I think we can definitely explore it more. and We might come back as well with some more questions, if that's OK, <laughs> if it's something that... Yes. Yeah, thank you. And Andy, thanks for your comment uh, in the yeah, chat. Yeah, I've seen this. And it makes complete sense that people with um, learning disability and autism would have been impacted even more by this. Um, and then what is it, if that's going to be the case, is there what is it that we can do to support staff and services to help people manage those pathways? And I think particularly for the, if I'm wrong, Laura, but I know if your discharge guidance are we doing a specific focus on people with yeah I thought yeah that so we'll have separate sections yeah for um yeah people with learning disability and autism mm -hmm. thank you and and just to raise um ruth and laura i don't know if you're staying for the whole meeting but we're going to be talking a little bit about the improvement work um with colleagues um across the southeast and and one of the things that um, we've certainly been discussing with systems is how do we draw out a bit like what you're describing nationally is where are we going to get the most impact in terms of the pathway and um, and that kind of improvement work um, what has come up and has been suggested just as Loretta said and Andy you've reflected in the in the chat I'm um, focusing on about how do we um, 
improve the pathway for people with autism and learning disabilities. So I think it would be one of the things we're also looking at, but linking up with yourselves would be great. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other um, questions or I've just noticed there's a comment from Gareth um, as a Samaritans volunteer and marked increasing callers who say they're autistic LD adversely affected by lockdown and just a, we're also doing some work on demand and capacity and forecast modeling and one um one of those pieces of work is is around how do we um understand and, and if you like forecast the impact on people with autism and learning disabilities so that's a piece of work we're doing that connects to this but is broader than this than this program and that really reflects um your comment gareth as well it's across all pathways i think yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or, or questions? No, I don't know if you're staying for the or Andy. Thanks, Katrina. Um, I'm, I'm sure we are all talking about the same thing and all have the same understanding. So apologies for stating the obvious, but can I just make sure that we do think about people with autistic autistic spectrum disorders and people with learning disabilities, particularly thinking around that discharge yeah. guidance the um challenge for us at the moment is mainly people with autistic spectrum disorder who don't have a learning disability mm -hmm. thank you andy really yeah. helpful point okay um okay so kathy yeah we're going to be moving on to your section in a minute um just before we do any final kind of reflections or comments no, thank you, Laura. That's, um, um, I think, to have a discussion, Cathy, in relation to that question. But just before we move on to, to um, uh, Michelle and Cathy talking about the, the research around um, inpatient experiences from a patient perspective, a lived, lived experience perspective, we're just going to give a, I'm just going to give a quick summary of the thinking we've had to date around the focus of this programme. I said at the beginning, um, very much a kind of a time limited piece of work. It obviously does align with the, the obviously the Southeast Acute and Crisis um, LTP kind of um, deliverables programme. Of, but this is really very much about improvement from a kind of quantitative and qualitative lens. But we're particularly interested in um, the impact of COVID. What we knew before COVID is, of course, hugely valuable, but it, the COVID lens um, being very much part of the rationale for this programme. So Jack in a minute is going to be talking about the data and thank you to those of you that have been very helpful in plugging the gap, the lag, the MHSDS data and the lag so that we've got more up to date information in relation to um, admissions, length of stay in OPS. Um, we've also, again Jack will talk about it in a minute, but we've also been quite interested in what's happening across the SPECCOM pathways in terms of admissions. Um, David's going to be talking in a minute about the um, capacity planning. So when we've got, um, you know, having now a really good understanding about what's happening across the southeast, um, how can we work with the CSU to begin to um, have a look at what we may be expecting moving forward? And there's an offer from the CSU and ourselves to work with you in relation to that. Um, we're going to be hearing from colleagues from London, a really fantastic tool they've been developed as part of the, if you like, the kind of the improvement offer um, in relation to um, inpatient demand and capacity real time. Um, we're going to be hearing in a minute from Cathy and Michelle about the qualitative research, and that's really about understanding the impact of COVID, um, as well as broader questions and how can we how can we work with, um, how can we use those insights and understanding from that qualitative piece of work to drive improvements across the Southeast? And then we're here as an improvement collaborative here today. And this is really about pulling all of that together, all the kind of national learning and thinking what we know, what we know in the context of COVID to really look at where we're going to have the most impact. So I think, Loretta, your question and your reflections, Andy, about people with ASD and learning disabilities, what do we need to be, um, if you like, um, suggesting is going to have an impact on that patient cohort in the kind of crisis and inpatient pathway. 
um, but also um, quality of care more broadly, patient flow, OPS, avoidable admissions and so on, and embedding the therapeutic inpatient work that Laura, you talked about earlier. So I hope that's just a bit of a helpful summary of the shape of the programme. Um, any other suggestions or reflections, you know, do let us know um, because we're this is very much about co-production. It's about working with all of you that um, across the southeast. So again, getting, you know, do, do ask questions or raise any comments or thoughts in the meeting or get in contact with us afterwards. But I'm just going to hand over to Cathy and Michelle, who's going to be talking about the qualitative research. Thank you, Katrina. Um, I'll, I'll make a start because I, I wasn't sure if Cathy was going to be able to join us, but I can see from the chat she she is here. So I'm very, very pleased that she's here. Um, so one of the initiatives that we were keen to um, pursue was to understand, not just to look at the, the, the hard data, but to actually understand um, from, from people their experiences of being um, on a, an acute inpatient ward um, during COVID and, and what led them to, to be there in the first place. Um, so we had uh, some initial discussions with the University of Sussex and, and Sussex Partnership. Um, so we're very pleased that um, Cathy Greenwood is here um, who will be kind of leading this research uh, for us uh, with a number of peer um, led trained interviewers um, who would be um, interviewing um, patients. Um, I think what we have started to think um, during the course of this programme is obviously we've had wave one and now we're kind of entering wave two. Um, and because this project hasn't started as yet, it's an opportunity for us all to come together to think about what are the questions that we would want to ask. Um, so that it isn't just focused on, on wave one, but we could learn, learn from what has happened and experiences now. Um, I've also had suggestions from other people that I've been talking to about uh, young people who are potentially on adult wards and what their experience is. So um, it is an opportunity for you all to, to know that the, the project hasn't started yet. So if you have any ideas of questions or people that we should be um, specifically wanting to, to interview, this is your opportunity to say so. Um, and also whether you are interested in having those um, peer-led interviewers interview um, service users within your trust to, to indicate that as well. Um, Kathy, as you're on the call, is there anything you would like to add at, at this point? Yes, so so the other thing to say is is thank you very much for inviting me and um, it's I think we're doing a, a piece of work which we have already started, um, which I think is also going to be valuable in informing um, some of these discussions and the next stage um, survey that Michelle was just talking about. Um, so we're currently running a piece of work um, in Sussex partnership. Um, which is to understand the perspectives on receiving services during COVID-19 and remotely um, for people who are from backgrounds that we don't ordinarily hear from um, and trying to reach out to people who um, are harder to engage and kind of, you know, um, may have struggled more in the current pandemic. Um, so it was important and interesting to hear your comments about um, people with learning disabilities and autistic spectrum conditions, because we have the opportunity at the moment to target particular groups of, of people and to ask their experiences. Um, we have already conducted about 20 um, interviews, which include a mixture of kind of um, kind of more quantitative questionnaire based data and and open ended qualitative feedback and on the basis of this initial conversation with Katrina and Michelle we've added some extra questions to our current interview that asks about whether people have had an inpatient admission during the COVID-19 crisis and um, whether they've had any crisis team input um, so it's already going to allow us um, to 
look at some preliminary data on um, for people from different kind of backgrounds, so learning disabilities and autistic spectrum condition, people who are older adults um, and carers of older adults with dementia, um, children and young people, people with um, psychosis and, and people who might um, ordinarily struggle to engage and, and give that sort of feedback. Um, as well as kind of the standard kind of primary care and, and mainstream adult services and so on. So we're doing quite a lot of targeted work at the moment. We've got a really fantastic expert by experience team who we've trained over the course of several months to who are then collecting this interview data and are both finding it valuable for themselves and, and have grown in confidence, but are also then able to kind of allay some of the kind of fears and concerns of some of our service users because they're they're talking to somebody else who's who's used services so i think things are going well um we've as i say we've already got some some data we've added questions about inpatient experience um so that we can capture that this kind of much more um kind of um much broader kind of questionnaire um we can then use that to help us to tailor the questions that we ask for the inpatient um, experience um, survey. But as Michelle and Katrina have, have said, it would be really fantastic to firstly get any additional comments that you have. Oh, I can see Liz is on the call as well, Liz Holland, who's, who's very much leading on and involved in this um, project as well. Um, to, we'd really like kind of your perspectives on questions that we should be kind of considering or asking particular groups that we should be focusing on um, and any interest in in kind of recommending service users who would be willing to take part in these this next stage qualitative interviews would be really valuable. Thank you, Cathy. That's incredibly helpful. So I think what you're describing is that we're going to be having some kind of initial um, kind of data, some initial kind of qualitative themes or, or feedback, which will presumably also inform the second stage of interviews. Exactly. Um, yeah, which is great. And I yeah. think, sorry, go on, Cathy. And, we, and we've also already, just by virtue of the questionnaire that we've developed currently with Liz and, and mm. uh, colleagues, We've done it very much as a collaborative endeavour with our experts by experience. We'd expect to do the same thing again. And mm. that has already allowed us to ask kind of pertinent questions mm. that service users have, have told us make mm. a difference. Like, you know, it might be easier to stay engaged with a service that you're already very familiar with. But if your mental health needs change or you're coming new into services, it's much harder to build new relationships when you're working um when you're when you're kind of interacting online um so it's so some of the challenges might be about shifting mental health needs and then getting support for new from new services or or starting new interventions with new people that's where i think there's a challenge and obviously we've got a challenge because covid-19 in and of itself the experience is likely to be impacting on the nature of people's mental health concerns and needs, which then may change what's what what input they're kind of requiring, and that's that's one of the that tr transition is one of the challenges that we're kind of exploring at the moment, among others. Yeah, thank thank you, Cathy, and I think just um, picking up on um, Andy's raised um, a comment in the chat about um, the independent mental health network in Surrey. And actually what's been very helpful is um, um, systems have, have um, given the contact details of local um, kind of organisations and mm -hmm. also um, also um, linking in with trust leads as well. So one of the things we're also planning to do, and I think Cathy really helpful to when we've got that initial kind of from that first phase of interviews, maybe bring some of that yeah. with some of the other um, feedback and information that the other um, local kind of either trust or voluntary community sector organisations have got, which in our kind of plan, we're calling it the voice group, 
but effectively it's a way of kind of bringing together all that different intelligence from a number of different sources. So we will be setting up a meeting shortly, Cathy, when it aligns with you being able to feedback that first phase. That's that amazing. Yeah. yeah. Great. Brilliant. Um, but that, I mean, I think it's really exciting, the work that, that you and Mark are doing, Cathy, and, and others, because it gives us that really rich um, kind of intelligence, but also from a bringing it into a research project yeah. means we can draw out some learning to feed into how we're driving improvement. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, and I think, you know, one of the discussions we had in the first phase of our work was the balance of um, quantitative and qualitative data, mm -hmm. because quantitative data is you know, is, is potentially less rich, but is also a lot more, um, a lot less time consuming to analyze. Mm. So what's really nice, I think, with this project is the opportunity to kind of collect some of that initial quantitative data, the, the, the brief qualitative data, to get some ideas of the sorts of things that we want to pursue in more depth, and then what's really nice about this project is the opportunity to then have the resources available to really do a, a good piece of qualitative research, which will will bring out not just kind of the themes that are being mentioned, but how big they are and how important they are and how shared they are across different groups and regions. Thank you, Cathy. And again, um, we'll obviously be bringing together, the, you know, the groups that that I mentioned um, shortly, or when it when it is a good time for the work you're doing, Cathy, to kind of have that initial um, analysis. But if there's anything else, a bit like Loretta, you mentioning um, people with um, ASD and learning disabilities, any other comments or groups that we feel we really want to hear their voice um, as part of this initiative, um, do let us know. Do get in contact. Brilliant. Thank you, Cathy and Michelle. We're going to um, move on to David now. Um, but just before we do, Jack, can we just hand over to you just to give a very brief update as to the data? Because the data work you've done is feeding into the work that, that David will be talking about in terms of the offer to use a kind of have a capacity um, a kind of capacity planning lens on the activity. Of course, yeah. So I just wanted to probably quickly say um, thank you to all of you for sharing the um, up-to-date length, length of stay admission and out of area placement data um, for August, October. Um, as Katrina said, there was a delay with the MHS data set, which means that we didn't have any up-to-date data for um, August, sorry, uh, yeah, August and September. Um, which meant we, did, we couldn't really share anything new at our reader assurance meeting on Friday. So um, we just want to say thanks again for that at such short notice. Um, the added benefit of, of showing that data with us is that we'll be able to use it within the data analysis project um, that you're all very much aware of. Um, and these are some of the key variables which you've shared in your recent submissions. Uh, and we'll be able to take these forward um, to kind of really understand that impact of COVID on demand and capacity across systems. Um, I would say that uh, we're really what we're aiming to do actually is, is utilize the um, MHS data for August and September and we're hoping that that will come out during this week um, but what we'll be able to do is supplement that data with the submissions that you kindly provided so we'll be able to hopefully use October data um, to really get to grips with that and understand a little bit more around around those trends. Um, also we, what we probably wanted to say was that um, it's what we're really aiming to look at as well is uh, the, the, the additional pathways across the mental health um, uh, care. So we've got uh, SPECCOM, which Katrina mentioned, and we've kind of been given um, some up-to-date data on that, which we'll be getting to grips with as well. Um, and we'll be diving into that data over the next week or so. Um, so yeah, I think that, that's probably all I really needed to say is that mm -hmm. we're just really grateful that you send that data through um, and we'll be progressing with the analysis uh, over the next week or so um, to really kind of get, get to grips with the understanding of commission beds and length of stay and other key variables such as that. Brilliant. Thank you, Jack. Um, that's really helpful. And I think um, I think it's also great to obviously to have you um, really working on this programme with us and also Fifi, who's here, because 
Um, I think some of the, the questions, um, Loretta, you raised about um, people with ASD, you know, we've got a really rich data set that we can kind of drill into a bit like um, Laura and Ruth were saying nationally. So if there are those kind of questions around, around what's happening um, in terms of some of our kind of patients or any aspect of the kind of pathway or flow, we can really um, be quite data led in terms of, you know, what are those questions and actually what's the data telling us? So thank you for that, Jack. Um, David, we're going to come to you just to, to do a, a brief demonstration of the CREST tool. And just to kind of remind everybody, this is in relation to this kind of programme. So one of the uh, one of the offers or one of the things we're hoping will really be of value is now we've got, as Jack said, all that up to date information. We've kind of accommodated for the the MHSDS lag to feed into um, working with yourselves to look at um, what the um, kind of flow could be moving forward. Cool. Thanks, David. Do we yep. need to put your slides up? No, I'm doing it myself, I think. Great. So bear with. Um, so. so can everybody see uh, green and red boxes, save this scenario, close yep. and return to summary. Great. Yep. Hi there. Uh, my name is David Cullum. I work with South Central and West Commissioning Support Unit as a senior analyst. Uh, and as part of my portfolio, I work with NHS E&I and look after something called the CREST model. And the CREST model is a high level demand and capacity model that enables you to look at the implications uh, for inpatients of changing your bed stock or um, an increase in referrals or a change in length of stay. And what the CREST model does, it says how many patients are you expecting? What are you expecting their length of stay to be? And how quickly do you want them to be admitted? And then with those three bits of information, it does some complicated sums, which I can talk about in detail if you like, and comes up with how many beds you need to meet the wait time target. What Jack asked me to do today was to demonstrate the CREST model in action and also to show how it might be used to um, do some analysis of out of area placement costs. So what I'm going to do is show you how the model works very briefly and talk you through what it's doing. And I'm going to jump to another screen and show you a little bit of work I've done with the data that comes out of this that gives us a little bit of insight into out of area costs. So what I've done here is I've I've created a service anywhere adult mental health in patients. And this uh, inpatient service is expecting an average of 365 referrals per year. This is a made up one, so I've made up easy numbers. That looks like one per day, but the model and the, um, the mathematics behind it knows that they're not going to come in one every day. It knows that some days you won't have any, some days you'll have five or six, and that's built into the into the mathematics. And again, I've given those 365 um, admissions an average length of stay of 100, again, just to be easy. And the model, when it's doing its sums, it knows that they're not, not all 365 are going to be staying for 100 days. It knows that some will have a length of stay of 20 days and there'll be some in there that have got a length of stay of 250. And so it knows that as well and it tests all the different values. And we want people admitted the same day. So waiting a bit time one day and we want and we're saying 98 percent. We want to be able to place 98 percent of people in our own beds. Um, through th um, within one day. So that's our ambition. We've got 365 cases coming in this year. We reckon an average length of stay of 100 days. We want to admit them immediately 98% of the time. Run the model. And it's now looking at all the possibilities. And it's come up saying you'll need a minimum of 122 beds. I don't know why it says a week, it's just 122 beds to see 98% of your patients within one day. And that's shown on the graph here, which I'll quickly talk you through. So along the bottom is the number of beds you might have. 
starts at 95 here all the way up to 130. The red line is the percentage of breaches. So remember we were saying we wanted to get 98% admitted within the day in our own beds. And this is the percentage that are going to breach. So if you have 112 beds, 15.7% of that 365, you'd be looking for alternative accommodation. You'd be trying to accommodate them out of the area probably, or maybe in, a, in an inappropriate setting. 117 beds, 5.7% are going to go out of area. And we're waiting for this red line to drop below the purple straight line, which is the 2%. And it drops below at 122 beds, where you've got 1.8% of breaching. And so for any given number of beds, it will calculate how many times you're going to have to turn people away in the course of a year on that red line. The blue line here is a waiting time, which is not a huge concern. We don't want any waiting times, really. We want to be able to place people locally or not have them waiting three days, etc. So probably not so crucial. This is more interesting um, in sort of RTT and acute, the 18 week wait times and stuff. And in your community services, maybe you've got your eating disorder uh, routine four week wait limit. So the wait time is a bit more interesting in that. The other interesting, very interesting one is utilization, which is bed occupancy, essentially. And at 122 beds, which is the one that pretty much guarantees you 98% of the time you're going to be able to accommodate your people locally, the utilization is 82.2%. So quite low. And as you can see, the cost of meeting the wait time standard, so the more beds you have, the better a chance you are meeting the wait time standard, the lower the overall occupancy will be. And your bed occupancy level in a way you can understand as being the cost of meeting a wait time standard. 80, let's find 85 percent utilization which is probably that one that's 85.7 you're going to be turning away 5.7 percent of your admissions at 85 percent occupancy. So that's that graph and then if we scroll down you've got all these numbers that arise from the calculations that you've just seen on the graph. And when we're thinking about out of area placements, the numbers we're interested in are the percentage of breaches. These are the ones you're not able to place in your own beds on the day when they show up, or the percentage given your number of beds. There's your 122, and there's your 1.8% likely turn away. This is based on probabilities, um, and that's how it works. So there's a 98.2% chance if you've got 122 beds that you'll be able to place somebody every, you know, on the day they turn up even if you get three on the same day. So that's what that's telling you. So now I'm going to, this is always a bit awkward because you can't just jump to another thing. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to share again and show you what I did with that data about breaches. Stop sharing. Share again. So now you should be able to see a green column chart with inpatient costs by bed stock. Is that visible to everybody? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Stay Thank you. So this column O down here comes out of the Crest model and that's the percentage of breaches. I've called it out of area placements, the percentage of all admissions. That's the percentage that you're not going to be able to accommodate at various levels of bed stock. So here I've got the number of admissions, 365 admissions a year. We're trying to admit 98% within two hours. Mean length of stay of 100. 2018-19 reference cost, mental health, mental health, care cluster bed day pounds, 430 pounds. So the annual cost of a bed is at 430 times 365, which is 156,950. Um, Jack gave me a sort of random figure of £750 for the cost of an out of area placement bed day. So using this, because we know the percentage that we're likely to turn away, we can use these figures to calculate, first of all, the annual local bed cost. So we've invested in 107 beds here. They're going to costing us six, 16.8 million pounds a year. The, but with 107 beds, 
we have to find, in through the year, we're likely to need to find 137 out of area placements. So we have to take 137, multiply it by 750, because that's the cost of a day, then multiply it by the mean length of stay of 100. And so at 107 beds, you've got a total cost of your inpatient provision of 27 million. 10.2 million of that is your out of area bed cost. And then I've graphed, put them all on the graph here. The blue cost is the cost of your beds. And the sort of purple bit is the cost of your out of area placements. And as we can see, the more beds you have, the fewer, the, the smaller proportion of out of area placements and the overall cost falls and falls and falls and falls. And actually it falls as far as, so I've got the um, team thing right where I don't want to. So your sort of optimum level of beds, if you're thinking about your whole outpatient, uh, whole inpatient budget for a year, actually you're best placed to have 121 beds because the total cost of accommodating at 365 patients with their average length of stay of 100 days, 19.6 million. So the lowest cost on this curve for that is at 121 beds. 122 was the magic number where you also meet the um, your 2% turn away threshold. So that's, that's what I did just to try and illustrate how you might use the Crest model. Um, and what you might do with the information that comes out of the Crest model. And I think Jack was particularly keen on doing something on inpatient costs by bed stock. I've just done a couple of rough columns at the side just out of interest. Um, this is the saving from each additional bed. So if you've got 107 beds and then you invested in another bed, the overall cost that you would save is 1.4 million. Yeah. Difference in total cost between 107 and 108 beds. If you add another bed to 109 you save another 1.2 million from starting at 107 you've saved two and a half million once you get past that magic one at 120 in fact once you get past 121 beds it starts going up again and that's because you're buying more beds than you need essentially you have a lot of um you have low occupancy so I'm always, um, I always find these difficult because I can't see any of your faces. <laughs> no, I'm so I don't know whether this is all nonsense or whether you've engaged with it. Is it making sense? Can I take any quick questions before our other colleagues Thank need you. to do their bit? Thank you. We're all having to learn this new way of this new way of working, aren't we? Um, <laughs> thank you. And and just to say, actually, Judith, you've mentioned the six hundred pounds, and I think we've actually got some of the data, um, which I think six hundred Jack is is about right, isn't it? So obviously, all of this is amendable. Um, so apps, yeah. So that's helpful. Um, I'll just put six hundred in. There you go. There you go. Instead. Andy, if you could, you say your question, if that's all right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. put simply, in, in one level, kind of um, inpatient admissions are quite volatile, but also quite predictable. But you talked about being able to vary. So, I don't know, an average of eight admissions needed a day. Some days we would have zero, other days we would have 15. Yeah. Would we be able to use this model to reflect the actual variance that we know exists? Yes, you can. So you can... Um... You'd have to talk to us about it, but if you knew the distribution of your length of stay or knew the distribution of your arrivals, then we can put a standard, a local standard deviation. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you know about standard deviations? Yeah. Yeah. yeah length, length of stay, we definitely do. Um, arrivals is a wee bit more volatile, but but we can yeah. give a good estimate. And, yes. and, and the other bit that makes it even trickier is, is not just numbers of arrivals, it's often people's gender. So I put in the chat yeah. today, we've got two males who need admission, nine females. We happen yeah. to have at least one male bed, but no female beds at all. Yeah, exactly. So in that, in that scenario, you would really need to separate out your women demand from your men's demand and say, and then that will tell you how many women's beds you need and how many men's beds you need. There'll, there'll also be some, I guess, which can be either, either or. Will there that come into that, or is it always male and female? 
Well, we're fortunate in um, some of our hospitals, we have beds that are suitable for any gender. Cool. Yeah. So you've got three pathways, essentially, haven't you? And so you know how many people fall into each of those three pathways in general each year and what their length of stay is. And that's enough to run the Crest model for men, women and mixed gender. Brilliant. Can I just add to that? It was um, as well as um, gender split, also specialty adults pq and older adults yeah yeah and, and, and what you need to do to use i'm not as i say i've just made up an example for the purposes of showing people crest really yeah um so what you would want to be doing is identify your individual pathways mm. um where everybody's more or less the same and model that because your pq beds you won't need as many of them as you might need, need general beds but lengths of stays might be longer or they might be much shorter depending on how you manage your peak but yeah. so you need to identify sort of homogenous pathways that, that that make sense and aren't too you know where people are pretty much the same on that pathway is ideal for this so you're 365 admissions per year you know you'd break that there'd be a bunch of uh, eating disorder admissions in there there'd be a bunch of pq admissions in there some of them would be men only ones some of them would be women only ones so that 365 might break down into eight or nine pathways some with 30 people in some with 100 people in and then you do a model for each and then that would give you the total number of beds you need across so yeah it's all about identifying the, the, the unique pathway really or a okay. common pathway that yeah thank you david that's really helpful and i think one of the reasons for doing this work now is what we've the kind of the thread of, of of the entire meeting has been about what's happening in the context of covid yep. so how can we understand what demand may be presenting um or what we're kind of um forecasting um at, in terms of cost but also activity moving forward yeah so the the crest model i put in 365 admissions into the model I'm loath to try and share my screen again because it'll probably break. But the basic principle is, well, that that was last year. Mm -hmm. What are we expecting next year? Yeah. 500, 440. You can just plug 440 in mm -hmm. and it will rework this and it will come up with a different value for your optimum bed base. Mm -hmm. And you could put it into here and it would produce another set of values here. So so the Crest model enables you to adjust your number of referrals really easily. Yeah. We had 365 last year, we're expecting 440 next year because of mm -hmm. COVID, because of demographic change, because of a mm -hmm. change in the referral pathway, who knows? But you know you're going to get more demand so you can model it through. Okay. You might also say, well, actually, we, we've been looking at this and we think we can discharge people quite a bit sooner. We've now set something up with our local authority partners, which is going to ensure um, timely discharge. Mm -hmm. So next year, although we got an extra 440, we've got 440 patients, their length of stay, average length of stay might drop down to 90. Mm -hmm. And so we can quickly just replace the 100 in the model with 90 and run it and get another graph that's, that, that mm -hmm. gives us the key values for that. So it's really easy to do that, that sort of thing. It's and so anyone with an NHS.net email account mm -hmm. can log straight into the Crest tool and use it and mm -hmm. save their work in there and there's sort of videos and, and user guides there. Uh, if you haven't got an NHS.net email address then you need to register and that is immediate registration unless your IP address is outside the UK mm -hmm. in which case we'll ask you some questions. Um, so it's open, um, open to anyone anyone to use and so once you've created your user account you can do some modelling there and save that modelling, mm -hmm. come back to it later. Cool. Okay. Thank you, David. That's really, really helpful. I'm just aware of time. So if there's any someone else's turn now, yeah. questions, no, no, no. If there's any <laughs> questions for David, just put them in the chat and um and then um hopefully um David you'll be able to respond to yeah, them. Um, sure. Brilliant. And I think there's a question from Loretta, so I don't know if you're able to, to respond to that. But um thank you very much. I'm just aware of time and moving us on. And um a really big thank you to colleagues from London that have joined us. Um I'm going to be doing a demonstration of the smart tool, which is actually quite different to the Crest tool, as you will find out. Um certainly when I saw a um 
when I saw a demonstration of this a few weeks ago, I was really impressed. I mean, it looks like a really, really useful bit of kind of technology to make a difference. Um, so that was why we thought we'd invite London colleagues to join us. Um, so I think it's Natasha and Joe that will be doing the, the presentation. And I don't know about you, Judith, as well. But... <laughs> I'll, I'll just give a, a, a quick 30 second intro, right. um, bearing in mind time. Yeah. So uh, as you've nicely um, introduced us, Katrina, it is a mental health capacity management system uh, platform, which is accessible via the cloud, which means you can access it via your mobile phones or whatever um, mobile device you have. Now, it, we developed this in London because we didn't have oversight um, in London of um, bed availability across providers. Um, and we had a lack of uh, understanding of demand um, in order to do some demand capacity planning. And we also had issues with the police who didn't, wouldn't know where to take patients in terms of a, um, a 136 suite. Um, and they could spend hours driving from one 136 suite to another until they found um, a place which had an empty um, suite. So the, the, the mental health capacity management system is a comprehensive overview of adult, inpatient and section 136 suites um, capacity. It provides views at provider, ICS and regional level, which support improved patient journeys through data transparency and shared situation awareness. Now, that's all from me. I'm going to let Natasha take us through the talk, because I think, as you said, seeing it is probably better than me talking. OK, thanks, Judith. Hopefully everyone can hear me and you can see uh, my screen. Yeah, we can. Thank you. OK, perfect. So um, what we have is we've got this is the um, home page. So there are three submission time points, um, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock and 6 o'clock. And as you can see, if the deadline's been met, it just grays it out and it will highlight the next one due for completion. So as you can see, the six o'clock is the next uh, submission. And if I click here, this will take us through to where we can go to a drop down to select which data collection form we want to submit for um, which trust. So as Judith said, you can also see it's split by sector and then we've also got the trusts as well. So I'm going to choose Oxley's for this demonstration. OK. So here's the data collection form. So we've got the three tabs, which are for the different time submissions. Um, what I did earlier is I filled in the 10 o'clock submission, but I'll show you what the um, blank form looks like. So I'll just click on this one, two o'clock. Okay. So um, it's broken down into different sections. So we start off with admissions. Um, and you'll see you've got two boxes here, so you can fill in for each of these indicators of value, and then you can also add in any additional comments. So that could be anything, um, any local intelligence that you might want to include. Um, it's broken down by acute male and female, older adult male and female, and then PQ male and female. Um, so what the trust will do, or the bed manager, whoever's inputting for the trust, they'll input how many pending admissions they've got for each of these categories at that time, so at the time that they're inputting the data. Right, as we scroll down, it comes on to capacity. So again, we've got the same splits here for um, acute, older adult and um, PQ. And what they'll do is they'll put in the core bed base for each of those categories, and that will be a one-time submission. And it will total up here, and it will show you the overall core bed base. Um, so once they fill that in every day going forward, that will be pre-populated for them. Um, as you can see here, bed occupancy at the moment is 100 percent. But I'll show you how that uh, changes when you continue filling in the form. So as I scroll down, we come onto the empty section. So what they'll do again, the exact same split. They will fill in how many empty beds there are at that point that they're inputting the data. So how many beds are available for admission? So just to show you how um, this calculator works. So if I were to put in that there are six empty beds, it will automatically calculate that change. Right. So I continue moving down. We come on to the section 136 core bed base. Um, again, this is the one time submission as well. So once they put that in, that will pre-populate every day. And now this field here 
is the one field that we ask um, the trust to input uh, to update as many times they have an admission or a discharge. So this will be over and above the three um, submission timeframes that we have. And this is to ensure that we have as close to a live position as possible for section 136. Um, when I go onto the dashboards, I'll show you um, a dashboard that the police have access to, which gives an overview of the section 136 availability across London. So that's why it's important um, that trust update this as regularly as they can. Um, we've also got some extra fields, so number of adults in private beds, medically optimised patients, and at the moment, trust are filling in up to the operational pressures escalation level here, so they'll just choose um, one of these categories depending on what their OPAL framework is. Um, we do have some extra fields here, which um, I believe will be updated um, as uh, more trust use the system more regularly and um, over time they'll start inputting data for these uh, categories here. So once that's done, they just click save data and it's completed. Um, now, if I go back to the 10 o'clock submission, if I wanna update any data, there will be an update data field uh, button here. If I just click this, you can easily just change that and if I click save, I'll show you that it captures the data in an audit. So if I click back on this, you'll see here there's an indicated information history that pops up. So it will show at um, one o'clock, I put two as a value, but then I've gone in and changed it and it's now three. Um, and when we move on to the dashboards, I'll also show you the audit log so you can see another way of how that um, how the changes are captured. So um, before I move on to the dashboards, are there any questions on the data collection form? I can't no. see anything in the chat. Um, if not, do put your hand up if there's any questions or raise them in chat. Yeah, it's Joe here. And just to add, there is a discharge section, isn't there, Natasha? And we're capturing closed beds as well. And yes, so some of the trusts have different um, fields, um, additional fields. So yes, we do have discharges as well that can be captured. OK, I'll move on to the dashboards. Um, so as you can see, there are a few different dashboards here. Um, these two are very similar, so I'll just show you one of them um, because this just shows you um, a day view. So the latest position of the data that's been inputted and this version will just show you a breakdown. It will show you 10 o'clock two o'clock and six o'clock. Show you the day view. Okay, so as you can see, it's, it's laid out in the exact same format as the data collection form. And if, for example, I filled in the 10 o'clock and the two o'clock submission, it will just default to the latest. So it will show the two o'clock um, information. Um, it also shows me on the right hand side an overview of an audit log. So it will show me how many data entries have been changed and how many times. And then if I scroll down to the bottom, it will come onto the detailed audit log. So this will show you what indicators were changed um, and at what time point as well. So if it was a 10 o'clock data submission that was changed or the two o'clock and it will show you how many entries were changed and the values that were inputted. And it will just um, continue for as many data entries that you have changed. There is also a function at the top to export this as a PDF so it's easy to share amongst your colleagues as well. Natasha, there was questions about yes. um, putting the reports as a CSV file. On the left-hand column, there's an icon there for the reports, and you can yes. pull the entire history um, of all the data entries um, for however long you, you, you've been using the uh, this platform. So in two years' time, you know, you could pull the whole lot out. You could turn and use this for demand and capacity planning, looking at trends, um, who was coming in when, um, uh, and when were the when were the pressure points throughout the year? I was thinking more of live data, okay. so as an API, so we could just literally get a live view of the data that was in there at that point in time and pull it into the warehouse, a data warehouse. 
Okay, I'm not sure about that. We'd have to speak to the developer. Um, so so you'd want. So, so it would be raw data and it would be live. It wouldn't be a report. OK, um, I would have to turn and speak to the developer regarding that. You're talking about transferring it into your data warehouse. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I don't know okay. the answer. Joe, are you able to shed any light on that? So we do have the opportunities to have different views of the dashboard. And one of them is for analysis. But again, I think that is through just downloading the Excel data or the CSV data. But certainly, I think that interoperability between the systems has to be discussed with the developers. OK, thanks. OK. Um, the next uh, dashboard I'll show you, again, these are two that are similar. So here is a site week view. So that will show you um, a week view for one site. But this will show you um, sites. So this will show you within a sector. So I'll show you this view. Again, you can see it's changed to a sector view now. OK. OK, so here we've got um, it's a Monday to Sunday view. And again, you've got the indicators on the left hand side. And it's also got some little arrows which compare the data to the previous day. And if I scroll over to the right, it will show you historical data. So for each of those indicators, it will show you position last week, Monday, and then also a six week average as well. If I scroll back over, you'll see it starts with Oxleys. And then as I come down, it shows the other information and then it will bring you on to SLAM. And then we've also got Southwest London, St. George's at the bottom. Uh, the so difference with this dash. Sorry, I'll just, just sorry, Natasha. I was just going to say that um, the London position is that um, the views are broken down by ICS, um, and they've they'll be moving from November to a view where London can see everybody's um, position. Perfect. Thank you. And again, this can be exported um, as a PDF. And just the one thing with this view is that there isn't an audit log. So if you do want to see that, you'd have to look at one of the um, first two dashboards um, that are on the list. So the last two that I will show you um, are a London view. Um, so we've got sites by sector bed availability dashboard. Right, so as you can see, this shows you all of the trusts and it gives you an overview of the breakdown, uh, overview of the bed occupancy and section 136 suite occupancy. And if you want, you can click breakdown. Now what that will show you is total number of empty beds and if there are any, where exactly they are. So um, let me show you one that I filled in. If I show you Oxleys, it will show there's 19 empty beds and then you can scroll down, you can see exactly what type of empty bed that is. Um, and likewise, section 136, you can break down and see how many are empty out of your core bed base. Um, the last dashboard to show you, and this is the view that the police get to see, is the Pan London section 136 dashboard. So this is similar to the one we just looked at, but it will just show you the section 136 um, availability. Um, what you can see here is where the data has not been updated today, it will show you the data source from the last time the data was inputted. So this is a test site, so that's why there isn't data um, inputted today for all of the trusts, but generally there will be a position entered for each of the trusts um, every single day. Well. So, um, Joe, um, I will hand over to you now to go through the repatriation dashboard. Thank you, Natasha. Just ask for control. Thank you. There you go. So another view that I'm, I'm going to show you is the one that is interoperable between providers and it shows the flow of admission referrals and repatriations to and from a mental health trust um, and other providers. So I'm just going to go to Surrey and Borders. And here 
information on referrals can be shown from a variety of settings, whether it's the emergency department, community, patients on home leave and police custody, on medical beds, and we're updating this to include health-based places of safety and other mental health providers. And essentially, a patient is entered into the system using the add patient function, which I'll open in a moment. And as long as a provider is named either in the acute or mental health trust as a location, host mental health trust or responsible mental health trust, then they'll be able to view the record. So for here, the examples are of a patient in the Royal Surrey and St George's hospitals. And in one aspect, Surrey and Borders are either the host and in another, they are the responsible mental health trust. But when they select themselves from the list, they'll be able to see all the points of entry into their trust from ED or another mental health trust. So as an example, there's another case here under medical beds from an, uh, an acute bed at Royal Surrey, where Surrey and Borders are also the responsible mental health trust for a patient who then requires an onward mental health definitive placement. The form is very easy to complete. It takes around 30 seconds. Most of it is from drop downs using calendars or time points as applicable. And all the responsible CCGs and trusts are already inbuilt. And you will just add where your patients come from and what type of provision they may, they may require. Can I just add that there is no patient identifiable data entered in, into this information here? That's correct. And in those records, whoever is nominated as a location, I'm going to again pick Surrey again, or the host or the responsible will be able to view all those records that pertain to them being part of this patient's journey. Again, the records can be opened up and broken down. We'll be able to see additional data that was put into the form. And there's an audit log of all the changes on that record. So what, what that means is if Saint, if South West St George's identify that um, the mental health provider is sorry a borders and they enter this in, in uh, enter the information onto their system if when sorry and borders go in they can see that information as well so you'll have you'll have the same view as uh, and can see where your patients are uh, uh, across the UK if, if, if everybody adopted this and if you needed to make a change you would just go update and in reasons for delays and log, you, you, you might put transport booked at and then give a time. What you wouldn't put in here is any clinical detail and we would expect all those clinical conversations to happen away from this system. This will be just to reduce handoffs around escalations, perhaps to your silver or to the surge teams or sharing information with the acute trust. So, for example, if I went to Royal Surrey under the acute trust view and entry, and the reason there is a different view for the acute trust is that they don't see all your admission referrals and repatriations from all your other areas, so from community, etc. So we look at Royal Surrey. It's a very long list of providers we have here. That case that was in the ED shown there, that the psychiatric liaison was provided by Surrey and Borders, and perhaps it was a Sussex patient in this case. And if we went to Sussex, they would see this case as well. And again, the medical bed, the acute bed patient who's on the Royal Surrey bed base, Surrey and Borders also then appears in the list as well. So that the bed teams in the acute trust know about the onward referrals, and then any of those trust that are reported as the host or the responsible can also see those entries too. So if I went to Sussex, as Judith just pointed out, the case is there. And 
that's, a, that's a lot of information. <laughs> Please ask questions. Thank you very much. That was really helpful. I mean, there's such a lot I think the tool does. Um, before we go to questions, can you just tell us a little bit about if um, trusts were interested, um, what the costs would be, how that would um, happen, you know, what the kind of practical steps would be? Right, so, so the costs are based on per CCG. So um, the initial startup cost and, and this also includes um, development costs and the training to roll out. So the first year cost would be 13,500, I think. Um, the second year cost, that's per year, uh, including all the support lines and any issues that you have throughout the year. And the second year costs will be less because there'll, there'll be no um, initial setup costs. And it's not based on per per trust or per provider. It's just it's based on per CCG. Thank you. Um, that's that's really helpful. Um, there's a huge amount there, but any questions or comments, Steve? So, um, is it per CCG or per ICS? Sorry. The right. So we started this, and it was based on per CCG. And it would be difficult to turn around now and move away from the pricing cost. So if 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 an organisation is formed as an ICS, it will be the number of CCGs that became that ICS. Okay. So if there's four, if four CCGs formed to become the ICS, it will be the price will be thirteen thousand five hundred times four. Okay. Thank you. Because we. we if we based it on providers, it would have cost more because there's more providers that than there were CCGs. So we, we, we try to do it in a in a, a reasonable way. Brilliant. Thank you. Any other um, questions or um, comments? I've got one, Katrina. Yeah. Hi, Andy. Thank you. Um, thank you. It looks really interesting. Um, and I should confess, I work for Surrey and Borders, so it was interesting to see you poking around and using us as, a, <laughs> as an example. Um, I, I guess I had a couple of thoughts. The first is hearing about CCGs. How does that work where you've had CCG mergers, for example? Well, as I've just said, we would still turn around and do, well, we all So is know, there a date where you say it's CCGs as of the blur? No, is a, is a, is a short answer because we could turn around and say it's by provider, but then to, to us that would be a far bigger cost if we go by provider than by um, CCG. So we're based it on by CCG, so it will always be if you, you will always know if four CCGs came together to form an ICS, it will still be that that price. Um, yeah, I, I guess what we're seeing is a number of CCGs are coming together to form a CCG, aren't they? OK, well, well, <laughs> do you know what? If <laughs> if, if, if if that happened um, prior to the last um, year, we won't we won't really know about that and it will be as is. OK, thank you. And and my other comment is, is this, I think, is dependent on everyone inputting their stuff on time. And I right. can see I can see the incentive if you've got someone waiting somewhere and you believe another trust is responsible. I'm, right. I'm slightly less clear what incentive there is for the 136 suites, for example. OK, so in London, we have mandated that um, providers do this um, and they... It, it did take about a month for them to turn around and get into the, the battle rhythm. Um, and the other thing that's built into the system is a reminder. So 15 minutes post the time, um, not only will the, the team who fill it in get an email reminder, it also goes to the coups for, from each provider. And that's a very big incentive. Because <laughs> of course they don't get many emails. <laughs> well, it, they all know that it feeds into it within London. The structure, the governance that's that's been um, set up is that it feeds into the gold report each um, week, and no provider wants to be on the naughty step. Mm. If I put it in a very nice way, 
No, that's that's really helpful. I, I was just picking up the assessment suite data where it was kind of like yeah. the 4th, 5th of November and, and it has to be today's and even today's can be out of date quite quickly, can't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And the, the other thing is that the, the, the out of area placement position, it, you can get... The, the other thing that London hated was that the... the they had to when they got that out of area position it was always a month behind so you're always looking at things retrospectively mm. where this you'll get that live position yeah. yeah which 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 you can plan better and um you, you can think about the tool that um david i think um was speaking about earlier on now the other thing that's coming online for london in november is um we identified um metrics within the fields, a number of fields within the dashboard, um, which impact on patient flow. And, and we've used that to define an OPAL framework, which will be running in the background of this tool. So as soon as those numbers go in, um, it will turn around and automatically identify that OPAL rating for that provider and you'll be able to get a dashboard to pull that down and use at your exec level. Thank you. Yeah, we've just started with my beautiful information that does that in a yeah. pretty similar way, but that's really helpful. Thank you. And it's Joe here. The other thing, isn't it, Judith, about the better experiences that the police have had. And oh, I just yeah. want to reiterate as well that we were using a test site today, so the data will be old because it's not the live site. That makes so sense. What, what I can do for you now, Katrina, I'll, I'll email you the um, brochure, um, mm -hmm. which gives a bit more information. You can you can circulate and share. It really is only a snapshot of mm -hmm. what we a very small proportion of what we showed you today, but it gives a bit of an overview. Yeah, great. And I think when I had the demonstration before, you were saying that um, once they've done that initial plugging and all the data about bed base and everything else. It's, it only takes, is it five minutes, three times a day? About, about, yeah, about, about two minutes. We, di we did a QI project around this because people wrote that it's good, it was going to be labour intensive. Um, so once they've done the first in data input, which you put your core bed base in, um, we wrapped a QI project around it, which supposed to have lasted for, I think, four weeks. After two weeks, everybody was doing it within two minutes and there was no point in continuing. Oh, that's great. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Um, what, um, and there's just another comment in the, in the chat, what, um, we'll be wrapping up some of the, ex, um, the, the kind of next steps and actions in a minute. But um, one of the, I guess, offers is, is for us to kind of support if, if trusts and systems are interested is, is um, we've recorded this bit of, well, we've recorded all of it, but, but we can send individuals that haven't been able to join this meeting, a, 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 the sec, this section of the recording, um, so they can hear more about it. But the brochure, I think, would be very helpful as well. So thank you for that. Just a question from Steve about the OPAL framework. I was just about, I've just typed in the chat. I will, I'll send the framework to you, um, Katrina, uh, you. for circulation. And, and I'll send it in the, in the Excel form uh, because I put, I put in some um, calculations and some scenarios. So you can play around with it if you want to tweak um, the, the indicator scoring. Mm -hmm. Great. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. Um, um, just a question from Claire. When you share this section recording, can the settings permit those not in the meeting to view the video? That I, th I think that's difficult. I think we've, Natasha, that's correct. We've tried that before and they're, 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 we had to go a long way around it to turn around and to be able to um, share it to anybody who's not part of the meeting. Oh, that's okay. just our experience. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's correct. We had to ask um, our BI colleague to set up a SharePoint and, and share it that way. Um, right. Okay. So complicated. All right. Yeah. On I, I've I've got a plan. I think there is um, someone in our team that has has done this before. So um, I'm, I was planning to get in touch with them to to ask how to share um, to divide up sections of the recording. So mm -hmm. hopefully it will work. Fantastic. Thank you. But really, really appreciate your time and really good to hear about it. It is a, a really, really good product and a lot of hard work has gone into it. So appreciate that. Thanks, Katrina. If you let me know um, when if providers want to take this forward, just let me know. 
Absolutely, thank you. So just going back, we've kind of moved around the agenda a bit. So Jack, was there anything you wanted to add in terms of the data? I think you've kind of given an overview, but anything more in addition? Yeah, no, I think I think we covered everything um, before. Um, yeah, I think there's nothing really else to add apart from obviously alongside the adult acute, we're looking at the other kind of care pathways and yeah. patient cohorts as well, including uh, specialised commissioning for CAMS, adult ED and perinatal, which we'll start to analyse over the next week or so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I think that's everything. Thank you. And I think what I mean, I've I've kind of given a summary of the program, um, which so hopefully you've got a sense of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and it's the mixture of kind of getting you know the kind of the data and capacity side of it, in addition to the qualitative, and really f bringing all this together. And as I think many of you will be aware, we, we've talked about um, bringing together a group that can work on um, some aligned, I think, with any national um, developments and learning and from around the country. But, you know, what are the in the context of COVID, but what we also know pre-COVID, what are the 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 kind of the 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 changes or improvements which will have the most impact? So I think Loretta's question about people with autism um, is, a, is a really, really good one. So for example, what's the kind of high impact deliverable for people with autism at the moment? Um, and we would really like to bring together a, a, a group of people that want to do this work with us. So again, um, really um, the voice group that we mentioned, so bringing together voluntary and community sector participation leads, and also the work that the um, University of Sussex and Sussex Partnership NHS Foundation work are doing. So the qualitative, the data that Jack's been leading on, what is that telling us? And all the other stuff around case studies and, and lots of the other kind of rich information as well as the national learning that was shared earlier. Um, so bringing that into something we can really use to drive change. Everybody, you are all, and for you know a number of years have been doing a huge amount of work in this area. So how can we share the kind of the best of it and bring it together in a really succinct, deliverable way, if that makes sense? So that's, I think, what we wanted to do. And we are wanting volunteers for people that want to work with us on this. Um, so it will be a kind of time limited, probably, you know, it won't be, um, we will be writing it up, but it's about the expertise that you bring and the clinicians that you've kindly given um, contact details for. So we will certainly be in contact with all the clinicians that we have by trust. Um, but anybody on this call that wants to be involved, please um, do let us know, get in touch, um, or just put your contact details in the chat. I did say earlier, for those that weren't directly invited to this meeting, um, but it was perhaps forwarded, if you could add your email address in the chat, we can add you to the distribution list. So I hope that's a bit of a summary, but I'm going to hand over to Michelle for the for the actions and next steps and kind of closing the meeting. Thank you, Katrina. And um, so what I have done is I have recorded the session um, so that because I was aware that there was another meeting that was happening at exactly the same time, which um, so lots of people had said that they were interested in coming but couldn't attend. So I will find a way of um, sending the recording out and also try to split it into sections so that if you want um, to just forward the um, the demonstrations to, to colleagues, then that you can do that. Um, I will also um, type up some of the, I've made a few brief notes of questions and answers that were um, noted during today's webinar. So I'll type that up and send it across. It may not be straight away because I've, I've got a couple of weeks annual leave, um, but it will it will come. Um, and yes, just a, a small plug that if you weren't invited, please put your um, email address in the in the chat because for some reason Teams doesn't give you your email address. So there are some people that we we miss um, if you don't give us your contact details. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And the um, thank you, um, Loretta, and also the, the the link that the national team shared about a case study. We will send those round as well, as well as all the presentations from today. 
and um, we are really hoping that some of you want to work with us on this um, around how we can really use all the knowledge and expertise and everything else that's out there to pull together where we need to um, make those kind of high impact changes. So do get in touch in relation to that. I want to say a really big thank you to the presenters. I think national colleagues have left and I think David's had to leave, but um, colleagues from London, um, thank you very much, Joe, Natasha and Judith. It was great to for you to share. We will be in touch with systems individually just to ask um, um, and to hopefully share the recording and certainly share the brochure, systems and trust to see if there's an interest in in signing up to the to the tool. Um, obviously, as Andy was saying, local areas have developed their own tools, um, but it may well be something that, I mean, what would be great is if um, everybody did, because that would um, be really nice in terms of the kind of mutual aid that I think you've spoken about before, and also in terms of 136, police being able to access the 136 data, and the more trusts that are signed up, um, the easier it is, I think, for the system to work. But a really big thank you to everybody, presenters and all of you um, that have been on the meeting today. It's never easy in a Teams meeting to have the kind of discussion that, that we would normally have. But I um, really appreciate you joining. Um, as Michelle said, we'll be in touch with the next steps um, and just some of the presentations from today. And thank you, everybody. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.